Welcome everyone to Fruits of the Orchard. Tonight we start learning Parsha Bahalotcha. <coughs> Excuse me. So the first one we're going to learn for those who have the book, it's on page 381. In Parsha Bahalotcha, many things happen in Parsha Bahalotcha. It's a very, very full Parsha. One of the many events or incidences is around Pesach. The guy commands that we keep the Pesach in the desert. It's actually the first time we kept Pesach in the desert in the second year. And what happened is the people kept it, but there were a number of people who were impure, ritually impure, because they were dealing with uh, a, a, a dead body. And it's a huge mitzvah to give honor to a dead body and, and to do it properly. But they became ritually impure, which meant that they couldn't give the, the, uh, the Korban Pesach, the Pesach offering. So they came to Moshe and said, we really want to bring the, the Pesach offering. What's the solution for us? We couldn't bring it at Pesach, but why should we, we be left out? And so Moshe actually did not know the answer. And the Torah says that he went to God and asked. And God revealed what we now call Pesach Sheni. God revealed that someone who is impure or too far away from the temple and can't get there in time, they have another chance on the 14th of ER. One month later, on the 14th of ER, they could bring the Korban Pesach according to all the laws of the first offering. They don't keep the whole Pesach, but they're able to bring the, the Korban Pesach. And so in the Torah, when it gives the two reasons why a person would be allowed uh, uh, what's called a second chance, Pesach Sheni is called the holiday of second chances. And on the word too far away, Rechoka, there's a dot over the letter He. And when there's a dot over a letter or a word, it's, it's telling us there's, there's some deeper meaning here that we have to look into. So, there's actually a disagreement among the sages. What does it mean to be too far away? We have to have a definition. What is too far away? So Rabbi Akiva says, and this is in the Masechet of Sachim in the Mishnah, that if someone is from the circumference of Modi'im and farther away, they, if they're inside from Modi'im to the temple, they have to bring it the first time. And the Bartanur explains what's the reasoning of from Modi'im and uh, if you're, if you're uh, farther away than Modi'im, you have a second chance, you could bring it the second Pesach. And the Bartanur comments that if a person would get on a donkey early in the morning in Modi'im, he could be at the temple in enough time to bring his offering. So in a sense, he doesn't have an excuse. He's within a day's journey. So that's Rabbi Akiva's opinion. Rabbi Yossi says, even if he's like right outside the, 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 the temple, right outside the Temple Mount, and the time runs out, he has a second chance and he can bring it again. So this is the, the, the disagreement. But before we get to that, let's look at what's the deeper understanding here. So everyone agrees that, like I said, it's called the holiday of second chances. In other words, the dot over the word far away is telling us, in a sense, 
no one is too far away. And especially Rabbi Yossi, who says if someone is like literally right outside of the temple and some, whatever, something happens and he, he can't bring it on time, then he has a second chance. So there, there, it's, it's a little bit paradoxical because we know from the life of Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva was a, a, what we call a bal tshuva. Until he was 40 years old, he was basically illiterate. He, he didn't know the olive bet. And after he married his wife, Rachel, and she made it a stipulation that she would only marry him if he would go and learn. And the famous story is he, he was having a hard time learning. And one day he went to a, uh, he was out in, in, in nature and he saw there was like a spring. It was almost dried up and it was, it was dripping on rock. And he saw that where it was dripping, there was a crevice in, in the rock and he had an epiphany and he, and he said, if water, which is so soft, can carve out rock, which is so hard, can my heart be harder than rock? And the Torah is compared to water. And the story is he went back and approximately 20 years later, he was one of the greatest sages in all of Jewish history. So one would think that the two opinions that we, uh, we supplied here would be the opposite. It would be Rebbe Akiva who would say, even if you're just outside the temple, you have another chance. And you think maybe Rebbe Yossi would be the one opinion that you have to be from Modi'im. And if you're farther than Modi'im, then you have a chance. But if you're inside the circumference of Modi'im to Jerusalem, you, you have to make it for the first time. So it's just an interesting idea. Um, and, and there's a concept in the, in, in the Talmud that says that sometimes opinions are the very opposite of what you would think. Ivcha de sabra, de misabra. It's the opposite of what you would think. As I said, there's reason to believe that Rabbi Akiva would be the most lenient because he was coming from the farthest away place. He's 40 years old and he's illiterate. So you would think that he would have an opinion that everyone should have a second chance. So the question is, so why did Rabbi Akiva say from Modi'im? So we gave the Bartunura's reason. And it could be that in today's world, we talk about, let's say a city, the greater urban area, let's say Los Angeles. Well, Los Angeles has all of these suburbs around it. So it's the greater Los Angeles area. Or for example, in, in Israel, Tel Aviv as a city itself has, I'm not sure, it's like, 350 or 400,000. But the greater Tel Aviv area, Rabat Gan and Cholon and all of the um, satellite cities that merge into one city. So Tel Aviv has like a million and a half people. So it could be that in that time, Modi'im was recognized as the suburb of Jerusalem, and everyone understood that. Modi was a very big center, and it was, a, it was especially a center for Kohanim. That's the whole story of Hanukkah, which we're gonna mention in, in one minute, that Matityahu and his five sons, the ones that uh, started the rebellion against the Greeks, lived in Modi'im. And of course, they were serving in the temple. So that could be the connection that Modim was just considered like a part of, of Jerusalem. And if you're in Jerusalem, you should be able to bring, bring the, uh, <coughs> the Paschal offering at its right time. So now that we mentioned Hanukkah, 
we can we can see a very very beautiful connection is that Hanukkah also has the same dynamic of you're never too far away. How do we see that? So when the Maccabees defeated the Greeks, at least in Jerusalem, and they were able to uh, purify the temple again and begin the service, the Greeks had turned it into idol worship. The temple became a place of idol worship, and it was desecrated. And the, the Maccabim, so they cleansed the temple. And the famous story is they wanted to begin the service again, including lighting the menorah, but they couldn't find any pure oil. And it takes a, a while to make enough oil to light all of the lamps. And then the, they found one cruise of oil with the seal of the Kohen Gadol and they put it in the menorah and it burned for eight days. <coughs> so the idea is that this cruise of oil that's hidden away, so it represents this idea that, that every Jew has a point of what's called the Pintala Yid, a point of Judaism, no matter how uh, desecrated the temple is, meaning no matter how far away a Jew is, there's always a pure spark of oil that can be uh, redeemed and with that can, can enlighten a person and bring them close to Torah. So it's, it's so interesting that, that Rabbi Akiva says it's from Modi'im that's the connection because uh, already at the time of Rabbi Akiva, Hanukkah was a holiday. In our day, I think everyone knows I'm from Mivo Modi'im. I live in Modi'im. So this whole idea of Pesach Sheni and Hanukkah are, are, is very dear to everyone who lives here. And the, we'll call it the, the humor or the joke is modi'im, no matter how far out you are, <laughs> you have a place in modi'im. <laughs> and actually we see that when we, we put on these huge festivals and thousands of people come and have the time of their life at these, at these festivals. And of course, Reb Shlomo reached out to those who were very, very far away and was able to bring thousands of people closer to Hashem and, and the Torah and, and Israel. And he did it all over the world, but his headquarters was in Modi'im for the last 20 years of his life. So here I'll just mention. Uh, quickly, and I'll encourage everyone to look at our Living in the Times for today, where I, I comment about Paul Simon's new recording called Seven Psalms. And when I commented on it this morning, I had not heard it yet. But right before class, I was able to hear on YouTube almost the whole thing. And to be honest, you have to get used to it. It is so different from anyone. <laughs> it's like completely different, and especially for Paul Simon. But the impressive thing is that he is soul searching his connection with God. And when you hear the lyrics, here is a person who his whole career didn't really bring biblical references. There's virtually no, no uh, reference to God or, or Jewishness in, in any of his recordings. Not like Bob Dylan and Leonard Cohen, whose lyrics are, are full of biblical references and Jewish references and, and even Kabbalistic references. 
And here, anyone can listen to it on YouTube. Here we see someone who he's in his 80s now. And all of a sudden, he, he awoke to have a, a, a real uh, uh, soul searching for his connection to God. So this is very, very connected to this idea about Hanukkah. Someone could be far away for their whole life, could be 80 years old, and all of a sudden, that little spark, that pintle of yid just comes out, is, is ignited. So we should all, all be blessed to have a second chance and to light that hidden spark that's within all of us. The second insight that we're going to do is, <clears throat> for those who have the book, is on page 384. And it's called Existential Angst. And I'm going to read from from this, this parsha, the halotra. So Moshe, in a, it's, it's almost startling that the Torah records this because Moshe is, he's at his end. He is at the end of his strength. He's at the end of his patience. And he says to God, why have you treated your servant so badly? Why have I not found favor in your eyes that you placed the burden of this entire people upon me? Did I conceive this entire people? Did I give birth to them that you say to me, carry them in your bosom as the nurse carries the suckling to the land you promised their forefathers? And I, here I don't quote it, but the next verse he says, if you like basically if you don't help me out here you can kill me I, i'm like I, I, i'm finished and god responds by giving him the 70 elders to assist him but the startling thing is moshe rabbeinu the greatest leader in jewish history maybe all of history gets to a place of total existential angst he, he 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 doesn't know what to do with himself so here in the verse when he says why have i not found favor in your eyes so the balaturim points out that the the root of this word here it's it's matsati why have i not found favor to find it's actually the same root as Hamotzi lechem mina oretz, who brings out uh, bread from the earth, and so here it's it's the same root, but here it means why have I not found favor in your eyes? So the Balaturim points out that the same root is found in a verse in 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 Job Eov, and that verse reads. Naked did I emerge from my mother's womb. And here, emerged, yitzati, is the same root as matsati. So the Bala Turim says like this. He says that it's as if these two verses go together. And so here... It's like Moshe is saying, for if I have not found favor in your eyes, why did I emerge from the womb? So the Baal Turing takes half of the verse of Moshe and half of the verse from Eov, from Job, and puts it together that they're, they're uh, I think I explained this once, that Rob Ginsburg says that there's certain verses in the Torah that are like soulmates that are, 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 are compatible one with the other and they complete each other so the bala touring puts these two together and it's as if moshe says if i haven't found favor in your eyes why why did i come into this world why did i emerge from the from the womb now the fascinating thing here is 
that, and if anyone wants to look it up, it's in the, it's in the tractate of Bhava Batra, uh, 15a. There is a long discussion about who wrote the book of Job, when did Job live, and was he Jewish or not Jewish? A very fascinating discussion with many, many different opinions. But one of the strongest opinions of who wrote the book of Job is Moshe himself. That Moshe wrote the book of Job. And so therefore, some say that Job lived in the time of Moshe. There are about, I'm just guessing, around 10 different opinions when Job lived. And there is a back and forth with different proofs whether he was Jewish or not. But the interesting thing is, is one of the strongest opinions is that the, the, the entire st story, the entire book of Job is an allegory. It's a parable, and it's not based on a historical person at all. Now, so what's the connection between Moshe and, and, and Job? So one that we could say there is a midrash. This is one of the midrashim that would indicate that Job was a real person and lived at the time of Moshe. But here, it doesn't appear that he was Jewish. And the Midrash says that Pharaoh had three advisors, Job, Bilam, and Yitro. And when the, the astrologers of Egypt came and said, what are we going to do with the Jewish people? that they're getting stronger than us. And what, what are we going to do with them? And, and, and later they said, we see that a, a savior, a redeemer is going to be born to them. So Pharaoh asked his three advisors. And so we're told that Bilaam basically was hard line, enslaved them, kill the firstborn. Yitro, According to the Midrash, he fled. He didn't want any, any part of this, this uh, scenario. And he fled. And later he was rewarded. He became Moshe's father-in-law. And according to this Midrash, Job was silent. He didn't agree or disagree. And we know from very many sources that in a situation like this, which is life and death, silence is, is passive approval. And so according to this Midrash, that is why Job was tested the way that he was. But we see in, in this week's Parsha of Behalotcha, where Moshe gets, in, in a sense, to the same place as Job did. Job was questioning God. His, 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 it was almost a, an identity crisis that Moshe went through in this Parsha. And the whole book of Job is, in a sense, an identity crisis that Job was going through. <coughs> what's, what's interesting that also connects the two together is the, at the end of the book of Job, after Job questioning God about everything, God asks Job 50 questions. In other words, after all of the questions of Job, God responds by asking Job 50 questions. And a lot of them were like, where were you when I created the world? Where were you when I set the laws of nature into motion? And there are 50 questions. So there's a very deep question, a connection between Job and Moshe, Eov and Moshe, because according to the Zohar, the term Yitziat Mitzrayim 
the coming out of Egypt, which of course Moshe was the one who facilitated coming out of Egypt, appears 50 times in the Chumash. And I, I heard Rav Ginsburg put these two together, that the 50 leaving Egypts that are mentioned in the Torah are, are connected to these 50 questions that God asks Job. And at the end, Job admits he doesn't, he doesn't have an answer. And in a sense, he second guesses his questioning of God. So this is just such a interesting connection between Moshe and Job. And so anyone is, is invited to, to try to look this up and see all the different opinions. Very, very fascinating. But as I said, the, the, the opinion that seems to kind of, kind of stick is that Moshe wrote the book of Job. And also, there is a very, very deep question, like I said, if a historical Job ever existed, or if the entire book is a parable, an allegory, that Moshe uses to, in a sense, probe his own philosophical musings, his own questioning and trying to, uh, not questioning in, in, in a negative way. A anytime Moshe questioned God, Avram questioned God, Yirmiyahu questioned God, Many of the prophets question God. It's not a lack of faith. In fact, it's quite the opposite that, that one would expect God to be the, the epitome of justice that we can understand. But we know that there's so many things we don't understand. So all of these great people in our, in our tradition, many of them question God, not out of disbelief, but wanting to understand the, the mystery of why do the uh, righteous suffer and evildoers sometimes prosper. And that is, if anyone wants to look in the tractate of Brachot, this was Moshe's greatest question to God. When he asked God, show me your, your ways. So the, so the sages say, what, what was he asking? He was asking, God, please explain to me why do the righteous suffer and evildoers sometimes prosper? So here is just a very deep question between Moshe and the book of Eov. So we'll end with a bracha that any, any questions that we have of God that we feel the freedom to ask as long as it's in, 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 in a uh, atmosphere of, of, of deep respect and year of, and, and awe of God that we simply just want to understand how, how God's ways in the world. And so hopefully we'll all get the answers that we are seeking.